Hey everyone, I'm Jordan Larson. And I'm Zach Larson. And together we own and operate Togiak River Lodge, located just a few miles from Bristol Bay and the village of Togiak. Now it's important to note what this video will not be about. This will not be an instructional on how to snag sockeye, line sockeye, pitchfork sockeye, shoot sockeye with a bow fishing rig, explode them out of the water with dynamite, gill net them, seine them, or harvest them in, in any other morally questionable way. Um, all kidding aside, we really want the focus to be on how to legitimately catch sockeye. Um, in Alaska especially, they are abundant. Um, the estimated run size for Bristol Bay this year is 70 plus million sockeye. Uh, last year's estimates were in the low 60 millions, over 40 million sockeye were harvested. They are literally everywhere. Um, in the Togiak alone, the estimated total run size was some, somewhere around 900,000 fish, uh, with a recorded escapement number of 280 plus thousand sockeye last year in the Togiak alone. They are abundant, um, and they're abundant all throughout Alaska. Loads of drainages have catchable numbers of sockeye, uh, more than catchable numbers. If we can just break through the preconceived notions that these fish do not bite. Um, and that's what we've come to realize over the years. We've spent a great deal of time thinking about, about sockeye. What makes them tick? Why are they so hard to catch? Why can you catch kokanee in a lake, but not sockeye in a river? Why, why can you catch sockeye in rivers like the Columbia um, or the Skagit for that matter? in Washington uh, reliably, consistently, but not in the Kenai, not on the Togiak, not in the Nishigak, not without doing questionable things to do so. Uh, we've all seen the, the, the flip or the flop, a bunch of guys standing on the bank line flopping weighted fly lines out there to try and, you know, hook these fish in the mouth, snag them, floss them in the mouth, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's what we're trying to break through. And what we've realized over the years is that sockeye can uh, put on display all of the characteristics of all of the other salmon and or trout species. Uh, we, we troll spinners downstream for kings, big spinners, six, seven, you know, number six, number seven, number eight size blades sometimes. A big presentation on heavy line with a bit of lead. And lo and behold, every now and again, you catch a sockeye ripping one of these giant spinners downstream. Now it's worth noting that on the Togiak, a lot of times we tip those spinners with cured salmon roe. Um, you don't see that in a lot of places, but it's something we do there specifically for kings, and it works well. And every now and again, you catch a sockeye, and everybody kind of laughs it off and throws it in the box, and it's a bonus fish. Something else that we've noticed. We do a lot of side drifting or a lot of bobber dogging for kings uh, with, with large soft beads and with cured roe as well. And there are days where for whatever reason, two or three of the guides come in and they've got three or four sockeye in the boat and they caught them on eggs. And we've just kind of written it off over the years. Well, we back bounce for kings, both large soft beads and row as well. And there are days again where all of a sudden you catch three or four sockeye, not in sockeye water, in king water, in deep boily runs where you just, you're not thinking sockeye and yet you catch them. As it turns out, we're a little bit dense as anglers, and we like to think that we know way more than we actually do know about these fish. And as it turns out, what's old is new again. At the end of the day, sockeye will bite a wide array of presentations, whether bait or artificials, eggs, jigs, spinners, plugs, kind of the whole gamut of traditional salmon lures and presentations. Specifically though, we'd like to go over two different methods. Really, it's one method um, with, with two different presentations presented in a similar manner. Now, as you can see in front of me, I've got a, a bead and float setup, and I've got a jig and float setup, and there's nothing revolutionary here. There's, there's nothing super exciting about these presentations. Um, for any of you who were hoping to see like the golden ticket laid out, the one magical method that nobody had thought about, I hate to break it to you, but we don't have anything like that. What's important is to find sockeye with it where they are not moving. If you can find them where they're staging, or at the very least where they're resting for a half hour to an hour, whatever it is. Those giant lines of sockeye that you see swimming along the bank line that people are frantically trying to floss or snag, that's not what we're focusing on. 
Um, we've tried, we've tried to get them to go on a number of presentations um, in those areas where they're moving. And like a lot of anadromous species, they don't want it. They are simply not interested. And I don't think they ever will be interested when they're in those travel lanes, at least in clear water. And that's something worth mentioning is that the Togiak, generally speaking in the summertime, is very, very clear. Um, it's not glacial. We're working with an average visibility of somewhere between five and 10 feet of visibility. And the sockeye are very sensitive uh, to light, um, to leader size, to presentation. They're so sensitive, in fact, um, on those gravel bars where guys want to drift fish for them or try and floss them on a fly rod. If the anglers get their, their feet in the water too far, if they're in past ankle deep, those fish push way out away from the bank and they skirt out and around the anglers. They're that sensitive to what's going on around them. But back to how we target them. The, the, the golden ticket, if there was one, would be cured salmon row. At the end of the day, sockeye love, love, love cured salmon row, just like most of the salmon species. Now, what you won't see when we're fishing for sockeye with eggs are large golf ball or tennis ball sized baits of eggs like you might associate with, with fall king salmon. Um, even, you know, even quarter or 50 cent size pieces of bait. Um, we don't focus on those so much. The sockeye love the eggs, but they don't like a big presentation, generally speaking. Every now and again you catch one that way and that's fine. There's almost a million of them that are, that are forecasted to go up the togiak, so you're going to find one dumb one here and there. But back to the eggs. So we got to give credit where credit's due. <clears throat> J.D. Ritchie has been instrumental in helping to figure out the sockeye fishery on the Togiak. Um, there's been a number of other guides who have jumped on board and really been passionate about it. Uh, lots of credit due to, uh, to Jake Wentz, to Kalen Fegley, to Steve Terrell, um, to Bo Smith, and a whole host of others who I'm sure that I'm forgetting about. But really it was J.D. relentlessly trying to figure out what makes these things tick. And really it was by accident. Um, just about everything's attracted to egg juice and single salmon eggs. And so JD with an underwater camera one day went and scattered a bunch of eggs in the Togiak. Um, it's, it's worth noting that chumming is permitted on the Togiak anywhere bait is allowed. Um, so that's a tool that we have that we're able to use. And JD put some egg juice in the water, hoping to catch footage of, of kings, both jacks and adults and rainbows and dollies and everything else. And the sockeye, at least that day, weren't really they weren't really the focus. But what he found was that as soon as those eggs were in the water, the sockeye came in in droves to gobble them up. So one thing led to another and pretty soon we've got boats anchoring on seam lines, anchoring on these areas where the sockeye are staging in the soft water near the bank, kind of hovering around that seam, um, not quite out in the moving water. And we started putting eggs in the water and lo and behold, the sockeye started coming in in droves. Now what we found to work that, that works the best uh, for skilled and unskilled anglers alike is a simple float setup. You can see that I've got this one rigged with a bead. Um, there are a lot of days after you get eggs and egg juice in the water where the sockeye will pretty consistently grab a small single bead. Um, you can play around with size and color to your heart's content. Some days it matters, some days it does not. What's worth noting though is the size of the float and how sensitive the float is set up. Um, sockeye are very aware of everything that's going around them, especially in clear water. Uh, light leader is key, um, as light as you can comfortably go. Some days that's 15 pound test, some days that's six pound test. It depends on how much light and just kind of the mood that the fish are in, if they've been pressured or not. Um, but for this rigging, we've got an eighth ounce Bomac float uh, with a quarter ounce sinker. And some of you might immediately go, whoa, 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 that's, that's not going to work out. That's not balanced. There's too much weight on that float. Our goal is to set those floats absolutely as sensitive as they will go with as little of the float sticking out of the top of the water as possible. Now these Bomac floats, like a lot of floats, they will suspend more weight than what they're rated for. <clears throat> and so this eighth ounce float with a quarter ounce sinker, we might run a real small split shot between the, the main sinker and the, either the bead or the bait, whatever we're using. Um, but this is a pretty good setup. Uh, the sockeye bite generally very lightly. They have very soft, sensitive mouths. And so you need a float that's gonna go down very easily with very little pressure. Um, but this setup works very well. We anchor on the seam line. We'll chum eggs straight out the back of the boat or in the soft water off to the, to the left or the right-hand side of the boat, depending on which bank that we're on. 
and you wait five to ten minutes and lo and behold you generally end up with a whole school of sake behind the boat eating the eggs off the bottom um, and that's something that's fairly important if you're in water that is moving quickly enough to scatter the bait below you where you can't see it it's moving too fast not that you won't catch some you, you might very well but you won't end up with that pile of fish right behind the boat that you're looking for now the second method or presentation however you'd like to look at it um, is the classic float and jig setup this is identical to how you would steelhead fish on any one of the coastal streams we've got an eighth ounce chanel marabou rabbit fur jig um, generally I like to run a, a two foot leader at a minimum it's going to depend on how deep the water is that you're in uh, for demonstration purposes this is short just so we that we can capture it um, the float that I'm using on this one is a quarter ounce rated Bomac float it's one of their torpedo floats again don't like to get too caught up on on brand or model use a float that you're comfortable with and that you like um, the key here though as with the egg or bead setup is to set it very sensitive. So this is a quarter ounce Bomac float. I've got a 3 8 ounce sinker on this quarter ounce float and an 8 ounce jig. This might be just a skosh too much. It's something that you gotta play with, but I'm shooting when I'm fishing for sockeye to have just the top of the float out of the water because they take it so lightly in a lot of cases. Not every day, some days they're ravenous like piranhas. A lot of days they're super finicky. The primary advantage to this setup um, is that it's not so dependent on the cured salmon eggs, cured salmon roe. Uh, certainly you can still use these, um, you know, sprinkled in the water or the juice in the water to get the sockeye kind of centered on the back of the boat. Um, again, for this presentation with clients, a lot of times we're anchoring above the fish on a current seam and just feeding stuff straight behind the boat. Uh, that way we alleviate any casting or mending, um, anything that's real technical. Uh, for the more experienced anglers out there, by all means, the farther away you can anchor from the fish and still effectively present your gear, uh, the better. <clears throat> but for us, a lot of times we're working with individuals who, who don't fish all that often. They might get out once or twice a year, and they're just not as dialed in. And so for us, being as close to the fish as we can and having to cast the, the least distance um, possible, it's advantageous. Um, but the primary advantage is not having to use the eggs. The jigs really keep any of the fish from taking uh, the bait deep down, which generally isn't a concern with sockeye. Uh, most of the time they're hooked in the sides of the corner of the mouth. But anytime you add eggs to the water, you get other fish that come in. We've got big rainbows on the togiak, um, arctic char slash dolly varden, um, kings, silvers, um, chums, pinks, you name it, they're there. They all like eggs, the kings especially so. Um, and we're really trying to limit how many fish we deep hook. Um, if we can deep hook zero fish, that is our preference. And when you take eggs out of the equation, that makes that way easier. Um, the jacks that we have, the jack king salmon in the, in the togiak are ravenous. They're like piranhas all the time. And what happens, it seems like the first 10 or 15 minutes, You've got predominantly sockeye behind the boat, and then all the other fish show up, and it can be almost impossible to catch the target species, which you can see 10 feet behind the boat, but everything else is in there, and everything else is a little bit more aggressive. So the jigs really shine there. Um, something that makes a world of difference is a small piece of salted prawn on the jig. Um, it's night and day. It's probably 10 to 1, 10 bites with shrimp to one bite without shrimp. Um, makes all the difference in the world. The sockeye really seemed to key in on that. Um, what we noticed <clears throat> this, this previous season, it was a high water year and the first half of the season, the sockeye were staging lower in the river than we'd seen before, but also farther back up in the sloughs and the, and the side channels than we had seen before. Um, really, they were kind of hanging out in water that you would associate with, with silvers, with coho. Um, and the bobber and jigs really, really shined. It wasn't just the sockeye that were pushed up in there. Everything else was there too because the water was so high. And a lot of days, uh, our guides caught their limits of kings <laughs> on these light jig setups, uh, which was a wild ride um, on a light spinning rod. It's something I'd like to touch on for both of these setups. Uh, we're using eight and a half foot medium rated spinning rods. Um, a lot of guys immediately go, oh, it's too short for float fishing. Um, for us, it works perfect because we're not casting a long ways. We're not doing big men's. Generally, the fish that we're hooking are within 20 or 30 feet of the boat. And uh, for our purposes, um, a little bit shorter rod's just easier to manage. 
Um, again, if you're going to anchor farther away from fish or, or fish a current seam that's far away, certainly a longer rod that's going to allow you to mend a little bit easier uh, would, be, would be preferable. Uh, but for our purposes, an eight and a half foot medium works reasonably well. I think the one thing that I would change or might possibly change moving forward with sockeye in mind specifically is going to a slightly longer, more limber rod just to absorb the shock. Uh, for any of you kokanee anglers out there, you know that sockeye uh, have extremely soft mouths and they're hard to keep hooked up. Um, especially when you hook them on either one of these setups, they go absolutely crazy. Uh, they're very akin to summer on steelhead, jumping and flipping and tail dancing and going on tearing runs, just super erratic. Um, and the hooks pop out a lot of times. We lost so many fish last year, probably because we generally tend to run our drags pretty tight and uh, aren't aren't quite as concerned about losing one fish because we've we've got opportunities, so many opportunities other fish. Um, for both of these setups and the setups that we run at the lodge, we run braided mainline almost 100% of the time. If you wanted a sockeye specific setup, I'd consider running mono, at least a top shot of monofilament <clears throat> to your inline sinker, um, just so that you've got a little bit more give and a little bit more stretch in the system. Um, considering how soft their mouths are because it really truly is hard to keep them pinned up. Um, something worth noting again, if I haven't mentioned it already for this technique, is that they do, they do generally bite light, so pay attention to your float. If it dips, if it bounces at all, if it goes off kilter, swing away. Um, those, those prawn chunks are like rubber, they stay on there pretty well. You're not going through a lot of bait. Hook sets are almost free in this case. So I tell my clients, you know, err on the side of caution. If that bobber does anything funny, swing. Swing away. At the very least, reel down to it. You know, a lot of times you're within 10 to 15 feet of it. The current's keeping your line tight, so you don't have to mend. You don't have to reel up a whole bunch of slack. Um, those, those small jig hooks tend to penetrate pretty well. And so it's easier just err on the side of, of stick them before they get away. I'm gonna take this one. Right. You know what? I got that one. You got that one? I got that one. I put eggs on. Really? Yeah. I thought it was because of that. Here you go. Oh, okay. I'll switch ya. Maybe. This one feels like a big one. It is. It is a big one. Whoa. 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 Look at that thing go. Right here. Okay. Nice, let the line out, let the line out. That's a beauty. You can keep it? Yep, you can. That was a good fight. Good job. Hey. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. We hope this presentation on Togiak sockeye fishing was useful and informative. For more information on fishing the amazing Togiak River, please visit us at togiaklodge.com.